We at Christ Family Church have chosen to walk through the book of Luke, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, to get the full picture of God's heart for his people. We left off the last time, it's important to understand this, we left off the last time we were in this series with Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River, preached by Pastor Jose. And uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in front of large crowds of people. And this is where we left off. I want to read uh, this section from last time we uh, went through this ch uh, chapter, chapter 3, verse 21. It says, when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. As he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now, we don't want to spend too much time in these verses because they were already preached, but let's get something very clear about Jesus thus far. Jesus has been prophesied that he would be born as the Son of God. All throughout the Old Testament and into chapters 1 through 3 so far of Luke. It's then announced by the angel Gabriel to his parents that the Son of God would be born through a virgin. And because that's the case, then angels, even uh, uh, shepherds and kings and magi, they travel to this young child who was born and they worship him. Who, why would they worship? Because he is clearly the Son of God at the nativity scene. Then we know that we've covered that it, at 12 years old he gets lost in the temple or somewhat gets lost but his parents leave and they don't know where he's at they come back and he answers to his mom who says you know we've been looking for you he says why were you looking for me didn't you know that I was at my father's house we remember that and maybe Joseph is there he's like what do you mean father's house I'm your father no I remember remember something yes um you are filling in as my my uh, biological father not even that but you're filling in as my kind of like my uh, what would we call him Care, earthly caretaker, right, Father? But remember, I am the Son of God. <laughs> and one more time, just in case the people at the back don't get it, in case there's more doubt, God has just affirmed at, at 30 years old that Jesus, you know, before all the crowds of people, he declares over him and he says, you are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. So we can all affirm that so far, that's been clear. That we are talking, when we're talking about we're following Jesus, learning to follow Jesus, we are learning to follow the Son of God. That's the truth. No one can change that. No one can alter or manipulate or distort that. But because Jesus walked on this earth, the way that the world works for Jesus and for all of us, is that, especially under Satan's deceptions, right? Things don't always play out according to what is already true. In other words, we live in a world where there will always be opposition to what is truth. That's why in our dictionaries we have words such as lie, deception, counterfeit, distortion, manipulation. And that's why we today must go to our next scene in Luke chapter 4 because it leads right into it. So if you've got your Bibles, if you want to follow along on the screen, we will see how what is already true will be challenged and attacked even against Jesus himself. This is where Satan doesn't use means or methods or modes to try to, try to attack God's people or try to thwart God's plans, here we will see Jesus attacked by Satan face to face. Read with me then, Luke chapter 4 verses 1 through 13, as it says, then Jesus left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil, be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. That's always a, a part where pastors like to throw, like, pastor jokes. Like, he didn't eat for 40 days, and then it tells us, after those days, he was hungry. And we would say, well, no, duh. 
he hasn't eaten for 40 days. He's obviously hungry. It's a pastor joke that usually people don't laugh at. <laughs> but it's supposed to be funny. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God. Okay, uh-oh. If you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. We're not sure how that was done, but we're talking about Jesus and Satan. They've got power to even pull out a movie screen, you know, in those days. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me. And I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, you have, if, if, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him again, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. In other words, no, I only obey God, not you. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Listen, church, as we read this, we have to all be aware that Satan does attack, right? Satan is attacking. And, and I don't want to just casually breeze through this. It's a reality. So I want to look in this side of the room quickly and just direct myself to everyone here. Listen, I mean, Satan is, is attacking He's attacking his, his church. He attacks his people. He attacks your marriages, your, your families. He attacks your heart, reminding you of every way that uh, you fall short, accusing you of your sin, uh, triggering you know, the wounds within your heart, provoking you. And of course, I would love to definitely direct myself here to all of you. Please understand because this is very serious. Okay, this is, this is a serious matter, and, and we meet with so many people, and people come and they confess their, their burdens and, and, and their, their, their sin issues, and we, we've all got to understand there's, a, there's an enemy that is wanting to take you in the direction of destruction, okay? He is wanting to sift people, you know, and, and, and we... As a church and as, as pastors, we, we have been entrusted with the task to, to save people even from the fire, right? Our community groups that gather, uh, that's, the, the, that's the role that we have is to come together and, we, and that we would renounce, right, the, the lies, the deceptions, the counterfeits, the manipulation that Satan consistently wants to I I insert within our thinking, we want to take those things captive. So let's get personal now. I want to ask to interact with you. Can you think about when, when was the last time that you've been tempted? Or are you being tempted now? Are you in the middle of this spiritual battle of temptation? And, and what do you mean? Tempted to do what? To think, uh, to say, to behave to believe what you know you are not to think, say, behave, or believe. What was it? What is it? Was it something new that you didn't know where it came from and all of a sudden, you know, you are having to face things that you don't know how to handle? Is it a season of life that Satan is using? For, for parents, it's so obvious. We go through different seasons with our, with our kids and all of a sudden they get to this specific season where it's like, whoa, I wasn't expecting this type of, of attitude. <laughs> what do I do about it? And you begin to believe things. Should, have I, should I have done something differently? Is something else going on? Should I do this or should I do something else? And all the while, Satan is inserting every single deception possible so that we would just simply believe uh, that, that he, is, he is in control. By manipulating that he is not in control, but that he is giving us control. Or are you facing something that, you know, it's habitual. It shows up every day. You've been dealing, it, dealing with it for months, even years. 
How are you doing with these temptations? How have you been doing? Do you resist temptation and walk in victory? Or do you give in and have you set up camp in the wilderness of your temptation for months, even years now, trying to cope or figure it out on your own? But really, you're, you're trying to find different substitute ways to find satisfaction or relief. Well, if we're going to cover a passage like this where Jesus himself has been tempted, I want to believe that today is the day of breakthrough for many of us here. And deliverance and victory over sin. Now, as we stare into this temptation, uh, we get an amazing picture that provides us multi-levels of impact for us to take in. It's not, it's not something we view at face value and then walk out with 12 steps to defeat Satan. There are degrees, there are levels of impact that we can receive here. We see the encounter between the man fully human Jesus and the scheming temptations of Satan. But the way that I would love to view this encounter is the way that before technology existed, people would uh, find entertainment by perhaps going to a museum and staring at a painting for hours. We don't do that anymore. Some people still do it. But they, they look into this painting and some people are walking by, right? And they see this person and then they go, they view the entire museum. They come back around and after three hours, this person is still viewing or staring into the same painting. And they say, what is this person doing? But they are, they are wanting to imagine. They are going deeply into the painting and it's, it's, it's stirring up, you know, the thoughts and the imaginations that paintings are meant to accomplish, uh, maybe if you don't like art, maybe if you go to a temple and you stare up to like, let's say the Sistine Chapel and you see all the, the artwork and the architecture and the detail and it's like the more you see, right, you know, the, the more you're aware of, of how beautiful, how majestic, you know, things are. Or if you're not into those types of things, you can go out and just stare into the ocean or stare out into the mountains, right? And you could see the more you stared into the ocean, you even begin to hear the voice of God speaking to you. Right? And I, that's what I want to do. I want to view this, this uh, passage of Scripture in the same way. We're staring into it. And the more we look, the more we, we see, and the more we receive, and the more that the power of Christ frees us from. Okay? At face value, we immediately see and can determine a few things. Right? The first thing we can see is that temptation itself isn't sin. Temptation is not sin. Satan does deceive so many into sin by making them believe that because they are being tempted, they are already defeated. But we have to understand that temptation is part of the, the walk that, that is, is part of the life of the person that follows Jesus. If you are following Jesus, you will experience attacks. And those temptations, those even desires, they themselves are not sin. So we stare into this text, we can immediately know that temptation is, is not sin. Um, because Jesus himself was tempted, right? And yet without sin. Another thing we see quickly is that Satan is persistent with his temptation. Do you guys see that with me? Because although Jesus does resist Satan, Satan doesn't just immediately just leave. He comes back a second and a third time consistently, persistently uh, attacking. Most throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he continues to come. Most of Jesus' earthly ministry included spiritual warfare against Satan. He even tells his closest friend and disciple, Peter, get behind me, Satan. All throughout his ministry, he is at war against the temptations of Satan. And we know even at the Garden of Gethsemane, he is so anguished at that moment. And, and we know that Satan is there, included in that, that moment where he's sweating drops of blood. We can keep also staring into this uh, picture here and immediately see that deception through distortion is Satan's primary mode of temptation. Remember earlier I pointed out that the last time we left off with our series, we, as, we assured 
again, right, what Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22 says, that, that this is what God had declared over Jesus. He told him in Luke chapter 3, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. That is, that is true. No one can change that. God says, Jesus, you are my beloved son, but Satan says, oh, well, if, if you are God's son, deception through distortion, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, and you, as the son of God, will be taking care of the angels. He gets people through deception, using distortion. Just think of, of, of this with me, church. Just think of... For a moment, the innumerable sin patterns of destruction that all of us fall into simply from the distortion of, of, of Satan telling us, if you are actually really loved by God fully, then imagine what happens or what people do when they are deceived to believe that we are less than fully loved by God. Imagine that. That alone gets people to falsely believe to themselves, now I have to maybe feel fully loved through sex. Now I need to feel fully loved uh, through people pleasing. It's a sinful pattern of I have to now satisfy that itch to be fully loved by people pleasing. Others now must demand respect from others in order to not feel insecure. And we can list thousands of sin patterns that are birthed simply when the message of the gospel, which that God loves a sinner like me, is distorted, just a peep, just an ounce. No, if you are really loved, then you would not. So, with this temptation, we, we've got a huge piece into how we are to follow Jesus into our temptations. So our driving question is, how does a follower, follower of Christ live in light of the victory and freedom of Christ in the face of temptation? Now to answer this question, the last thing we're going to do is use this temptation account as a 12-step process to you know, kind of use what Jesus did as our way to defeat Satan in the face of temptation. Because that's not the main point here. But here is a visual I want all of us to see. And we're going to stare into this account. And I want you to view this visual as we will look at the multifacets, right, of what we're seeing here. One, we're seeing that Jesus is our mediator. And we're going to talk about that. Jesus also is our motivation. And Jesus is our model. Remember this picture now as we walk through the text. Just keep it in mind. Draw it yourself. Take a picture. This is what we're going to be looking at. So as we answer the question, how does a follower of Christ live in light of the victory and freedom of Christ? We look at first, Jesus is my mediator before temptation. Because when he left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, now... Before I continue, does everyone know what that means, mediator? Does everyone know what that word means, that Jesus is my mediator? Everyone know? Yes? Everyone understand? Media? It's important. The Christian life without that one word is impossible to live out. You cannot be a Christian without a mediator. We cannot come to God without a mediator. We will not be accepted to God's presence with our sin as sinners because God is holy, holy, holy who cannot be in the presence of sin without judging it. So we need a mediator. And this is the driving reason for this text. When Luke wrote this section in chapter 4 so that his audience, Theophilus, would read it and today we would also have it as part of the inspired word of God. Why, why is that? It's so that we would all know that it was God who sent Jesus to the wilderness as a fully human man to be tempted by Satan. What for? Because God had a plan through Jesus, our mediator, to benefit you and me. That his perfect obedience 
would be fulfilled on our behalf, giving us, gifting us victory over Satan. Simple faith and trust and dependence on that will defeat Satan. Knowing that Jesus is our mediator because he was tempted in every way, yet without sin on my behalf, gives me now, credits me that authority to defeat Satan. We would not have Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 that tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with, with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Now, some are tempted to think, well, of course, Jesus, uh, he would not fall to the temptation because although he was human, he was also fully God. It's not the same as we who are simply humans. But in these moments, as we know, Jesus did not take advantage of his equality with God to, to, to use that, right? Look, I'm God, so I'm going to use a little bit of my divinity in order to defeat Satan. No, he, he was fully man, fully human, bearing under the entire weight of sin, and yet he didn't give in. And therefore, he bore the full weight of it in our place, on our behalf. It's like if you go to the gym, the person that really understands how heavy a weight is, is the person that actually is able to lift that weight, not the person that gives in and says, I can't lift this. They probably felt a bit of it and realized it was too heavy, but they did not feel the full weight of it. So therefore, the primary and driving reason why we have this account is not so that we would simply use it as an example for us to resist temptation in the same way that Jesus did, but on our own. Instead, the driving reason, church, please listen. The driving reason why we have this account is so that when we think of right now, all the ways that we have been tempted and have failed, all the ways that we continue to fail, when we think of the ways that we've been deceived into the consequences of sin, and when we look into the future and worry over, maybe some will say not so much ourselves, but worry over, I mentioned earlier, our children and what decisions are they going to make. When we think of all of that, we stare into this account as a power source of knowing that we've received the benefits of the conqueror who, dis who defeated sin and Satan. So that in him, although we have failed, nevertheless, we would right now receive his righteous victory. Think about the future. Think about your children. Think about the, the things that you've failed in or the ways that you've fallen short or the, the bitter taste of the consequences of sin that you today are drinking, right? And you yourselves are in it, in the middle of it. And you're trying to fix things and make things right. But to simply know, right, that you have a, a, a power source, brothers and sisters. It ought to free your entire worldview. It ought to liberate your belief system about your, your past, your present temptation, and your destiny as a follower of Christ. You can today, as we're sitting here, you can have a, a metaphorical or even literal conversation with Satan himself. And you could tell him, Satan, you might have gotten me in the past. You might be hovering over my family. You might be attacking through different means and I'm getting all flustered and frustrated and angry. You might be attacking even my marriage and you might very well get me again. And I may be even tasting the bitter fruit of the consequences of the sin that I got myself into. I admit that my flesh was deceived to believe and go after the allurement and temptations of sin. But this is what you can say. Nevertheless, however, I attach myself to Christ who has defeated you. In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, 
Because what he fulfilled in the wilderness when you tempted him, he didn't do so just for fun. He didn't do so just to get one over you. He didn't do so for kicks. He did so for me. Therefore, I confess, I repent of my sin, and I run to my Father. Of course, in that moment, we think that we, we have, we have, we have um, secured the truth. But remember, Satan comes back a second and a third time. Satan might say, well, if you run to the Father, you think God really does accept people like you? Don't you remember what you just told your so-and-so, your spouse, your children? Don't you remember how you, you just lost your cool and you said sinful, harsh things? Are you sure God accepts? I mean, he'll accept you, but people like you, perhaps? You sure he does that? Because if he does, he would only accept, and Adam started thinking, yeah, he accepts. Well, wait, 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 wait a minute. No, 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 there I go again, but, but not this time. Let me stop you there. He accepts me by the merits of Christ, not mine. And that's why we can read in Hebrews chapter 2, 17, that therefore he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. And we attach ourselves to that in order to run to the Father. Now, I believe that the subsequent inner reaction of a person that is contemplating and believing because here we're in the level of like simple you know by faith alone in Christ alone by the merits of Christ alone I'm not striving I'm not seeking to do anything else right now I'm simply believing that by faith alone in Christ alone I have access to the Father that alone ought to it ought to produce in me an understanding that as Jesus is my mediator before temptation, I begin to now have new affections, new mot motivations to live in Christ. I want to live in him now. I want to live for him now. I want to live through him now. I want to live with him. My life belongs to Jesus. And so Romans chapter 6 verse 16 describes this a bit as we we talk about both sides it says don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves you are slaves of the one you obey either of sin leading to death or of disobedient or of obedience I'm sorry leading to righteousness that's where like my new affections my new motivations okay I want to live in Christ I want to live for Christ I want to obey Jesus and therefore obey him leading me to righteousness but thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. That's the preaching or the teaching of the gospel. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. That's leading us to our second point. Jesus is my motivation before temptation. That could be kind of a line to a song. Motivation before temptation, because it rhymes. And we could read that Jesus answered Satan, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is said, do not test the Lord your God. We see that although Satan tries to steer Jesus toward other motivations and and, and what is he doing? What is Satan doing? He is doing exactly what he did with Adam and Eve, right? He is, he is steering them away into other motivations. And he conquered and he, he, did, he did defeat Adam and Eve. He did that as, as well all throughout Israel's, God's people's history many times. And Jesus, Jesus though now is is before Satan, and, he, and Satan is trying to do the same thing. But Jesus accomplishes for us a pathway to new motivations. Now, I do want to ask as a congregation so that we maintain interaction. Let's, let's make sense of this together. I want to ask this question. How does Jesus become my motivation before temptation? 
and I would open that up for anyone to just yell it out, right? How does Jesus become my motivation before temptation? Anybody? No right or wrong answer. These are always the awkward moments that sometimes I get myself into. But, but let's just cry it out. How, does, how is Jesus your motivation before temptation? Anybody? I'm sorry? Okay, you want to live as he did. Follow him as he did, okay? As we already said, we know that he is my motivation. He's my mediator. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, yes. He defeats Satan, so now I have hope. Anybody else? Say that again. Well, we know that he, he died for me. He paid the ultimate price. Anybody else? His example, okay. Well, the way that I would think about it is that, as we sang earlier, perhaps, right? We sang the song, the third song that we sang was Jesus. Let me see if you guys were paying attention. It, it had this driving theme, the third song that we sang. You are my champion, right? Jesus becomes my motivation because I have a champion. A champion that has defeated my greatest enemy, I have a refuge, I have a strength, I have a fortress. I have a conqueror over sin and Satan. Because Jesus resisted, I know that I can now also choose to resist, to resist temptation too. In and through him. Yes, I can. Yes, I can resist temptation. Not that I try to copy him but I attach myself to him. Not that I observe him for a while and that I say, thank you, Jesus. I've got it on my own to be a better person now. But I choose to surrender my life and I can follow him so that he is present with me in the face of temptation as my champion, as my source of hope, as the very message and gospel that I know that even up to the point of death, Jesus died for me. And rose again to give me eternal life. I can choose to resist all temptations to in him. So this changes the purpose and motivation in the way I live my life from. Okay, he, he, here's the answers that I'm trying to look for. I can now, as Jesus is my motivation, I can now live a life that is dependent in him rather than independent from him. I can live a life that is in the name of Jesus and for his kingdom rather than in the name of myself and trying to build my little kingdom. It's like, like Satan ridicules. He smashes every time we try to build our little kingdom. And that's what he uses to get between families and get between all types of you know, sin patterns that we fall into. It's when we're pursuing building our own kingdoms, and we do that in so many, way, so many ways, Try to control things, control ourselves, control people. Uh, more than what we have time to get in, into. It's the difference between living in the spirit versus living in the flesh. So when we read a passage like Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, we can understand when it says, But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You can resist when you walk in the Spirit, when you're walking dependently in Him, when you walk in the name of Jesus. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, let's remember as we continue to stare into this account is that Satan's temptations are never obvious. They become obvious later on, more so when we're actually in the consequences of the things that we fall into. But at the moment, they're not obvious. He's very attractive and appears even good and godly. Most of the time, he uses scripture as he is doing so before Jesus, and he will do so for those that follow Jesus. But thankfully, we are given in our text a measure to self-examine so that we are not blinded to the ways that Satan attacks. So then, how do we know he is attacking? 
Here's one of the ways when he is messing with our appetites. When he is messing with our appetites. Uh, we can see that, that uh, he is using, and this is a kind of a sequence thing that he does, right? I, 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 we've, we've come to find out, you know, Satan, he, he works in similar ways, you know, even though he's using deception. But he messes with our appetites. And of course, Jesus is, is, is hungry. He's, he hasn't eaten in 40 days. And he's going to utilize, you know, his appetite of hunger. And then that will lead us to then, you know, to, for him to mess with uh, our affections. Because when we're hungry, then we begin to desire, you know, something to feed that hunger. And so now, now, now we are, we are, we are, we are being allured, you know, to a, a, an affection that Satan wants us to desire after or to fall into. And then that's when that is messing with our allegiance, right? Where it's like, okay, I, 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 I got, you know, I entered through this this appetite within his heart. I presented this other, you know, source of satisfaction, and now I will get him to renounce obeying God and instead obey me. For example, this is how he works. In the same way that Jesus was hungry, not eating for 40 days, Satan's temptation will be to, to get him to satisfy that hunger, such as, I can recognize that my bread is... If I am aware that I crave, my appetite is for approval. I'm not saying that's, that's me at the moment. I'm just saying that's an example. I crave approval from others. Satan's temptation will be to not look to Jesus for all the approval that I need. Instead, through deception, he will get me to believe or to even think for a moment that I'm not accepted, but I am rejected. And then when I'm believing that, that's where, I'm, that's where my faith is now, now. He will offer a substitute in order to satisfy that hunger of approval. And what does he use? He'll use anything else that is not Jesus. Anything. My craving, my appetite, my motivation now becomes that anything else. He uses the good things, especially if we're good, behaving Christians. He will use the good things or the people or the relationships like family, like ministry. And then he'll get us to mess with our affections. And now we are worshiping and serving the substitute as opposed to the Lord. And, and what is happening He's got, our, he's got our appetite. He's got our affections. Now he's got our allegiance. He messes with our allegiance to God because we put now God to the test by being disobedient to him. And all that through an, a craving, an appetite for more approval. We can say this about attention. You know, I want more attention. And you just, just a peep. You, you're insignificant. You'll never get attention Although we know that Jesus died on the cross for us, you know, we want something else or, or we want respect. And so in order to get respect, you know, you know you, you, you're just not, not respectable enough. In fact, you're worthless. You get us to believe that. If not respect, it's comfort. Oh man, that's the generation that we live in, comfort. So any means of suffering, any means of discomfort or inconvenience, anything Okay, no, no, not, no, 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 no. I, I, that, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. And, and Satan, the way that he'll work, he, he'll provide something, a substitute, that will, that will manipulate us to believe that this will provide us the comfort that we want. Other people will be controlled. And just by shaking things up and making things uncertain, but if we attach ourselves to Jesus, we are reminded that our appetites are satisfied in him, and he is our motivation. If not, if not, we will succumb to and not resist Satan's temptations. And that's when we can self-reflect at that moment. Is Jesus truly my motivation? Does that make sense so far, church? Does that make sense? 
I mean, the point here is to determine, to examine the way that, that Satan worked with Jesus and did not, did not accomplish his goal with Jesus. In that same way, we get to see Jesus and he remains our mediator and our motivation, right? Understanding of all the ways that, that we are we are after, our appetites are after, and, and then our affections go after, and we begin to somewhat exalt like an idol and in a way serve and worship according to those affections. And now we find ourselves, we are allegiant, right? We are serving another master. So uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 16 warns us about this and in a very straightforward way tells us, do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, this is also the way that Satan attacked Jesus, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And, and that's why we're asking the question, okay, I want, to, I want to obey and submit to a passage like this. Lord, I want to do your will, God, in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're asking that question. How does a follower of Christ live in light of the victory and freedom of Christ in the face of temptation so that I'm not then falling or succumbing to the temptations of the world? And we would answer that, well, as Jesus remains my mediator before temptation. You know, nothing can change that. Jesus is my mediator as long as I know that I've placed my faith and trust in him. Therefore, now I can choose to keep my eyes fixed on my mediator. And that now becomes my motivation. I want to live for him before temptation. And it's only then do we see, as our closing point, that Jesus is my model before temptation. Some people were, you know, saying, you know, he becomes our example. He becomes, you know, someone we want to follow or imitate. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so I, I put there the last verse, the closing verse of our text. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Now, when I read that Satan departed from Jesus, I want to know what exactly did Jesus do that I can do too as a follower of Jesus? What can I do? I want Satan to also depart from me. And we know that that's what we're commanded to. To resist Satan and he will do what? He will flee from us. This is when the WWJD bracelets come in handy. Anybody wearing those today? What would Jesus do? I want to ask, what would you do, Jesus, in the face of temptation? Well, as we finish, what does Jesus do into, uh, as we stare into this account of Satan's temptation? Well, we don't see Jesus jumping through hoops, right, to resist Satan. He doesn't start chanting or dancing around the fire to defeat Satan. We definitely don't see that Jesus now negotiates with Satan. Do we see that? Do we see that that's what he does? Well, Satan, if this, well, maybe this. Maybe. He doesn't do that. Please listen to this. He definitely doesn't flirt with the idea of even, even budging according to the temptations. Such as what? Well, okay, Satan. I'll turn these stones into bread just to prove to you that I am the son of God, but I won't eat the bread. He doesn't even flirt with that idea. It's like the person, right, that we know that, okay, no, I'm not going to fall into that sin, but at least I will look at it. At least I'll pass by the candy store. Well, I'm not going to eat it, but I will at least go in and smell the candy. Well, I'm not going to just smell it. I want to touch the one that I would. <laughs> this is the one that I would choose. And then before, no, I would choose it. Let me just touch it. Before, let me just touch it. Let me just open it. Let me just open it. Let me now just smell it. Let me smell it. Let me now just taste it. He doesn't flirt with the idea of 
budging, not even an inch, with Satan. But we do know that Jesus wants his followers, as he himself commanded us to Matthew chapter 26, 41, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Because the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. So how does Jesus do it? Jesus resists the devil by quoting the truth of Scripture against him. Do we see that? If we look at Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about putting on the armor of God, we have the belt of truth that holds everything together. All our armor is held together by the truth. And those are all defensive armor, all defensive weapons that we have. And it's like Satan tries, but the truth kind of has everything together. It's like a fortress that I am surrounded by. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, what I simply need to, by faith, affirm and receive, be assured with. But then there is an offensive weapon, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We know the word of God is the truth of God, right? And so, so the way that we, the model that we have in Jesus is to know that we have and can submit every temptation under the truth of God's word. Everything could submit under the true lordship of Jesus Christ. And it, whether it be done through private prayer and you just pray the truth, whether it be done over a loved one and you just proclaim the truth of God, renouncing all of Satan's temptation, rejecting and rebuking all the ways that Satan has up to this point, grabbed a, a stronghold or entered through some wound, we can fight back with, with the proclamation of truth against Satan's temptations. Whether it sometimes requires us to cry it out with a loud voice. Some people just feel like awkward or weird about speaking Jesus into the atmosphere. Speaking Jesus into situations and contexts. Sometimes it requires just singing songs of worship that proclaim the truth. Some people ask us, you know, and this is, this is frequent, frequent because we at our church, we want to assure, right, Jose, that we are theologically sound at our church. We don't want anything to deviate from what is sound theology. We know we, we do that as opposed to the many churches out there that do preach false theology. And sometimes some of these churches write some pretty amazing praise and worship songs, right? And sometimes then we sing those worship songs and we got people that then come will tell us like, how is it that we're singing this song that, that has been written by this other church that doesn't preach sound theology? What do you guys, why do you do that? Well, the measure that we use at our church is like, look, even if this is a hymn written by someone, you know, hundreds of years ago, and that author owned slaves, or that author committed adultery, or that author was li living in any sinful pattern, or even today, a song is written, if we find and we pass it through the filter of truth, and we see that according to God's word, the words of this song bear the truth, we're going to sing it. And the reason why we're going to sing this song, it's because we want to assure that the truth of God that is, that is firm, that is faithful to the word of God is proclaimed at our church. Not just as a song of worship, but as a song that exalts the truth, the truth of Jesus in the face of all of Satan's deceptions and lies as we are tempted by them and we drag ourselves into a, a worship on Sunday, sometimes carrying the weight that we can't carry of those temptations. And all of a sudden, we are proclaiming the truth. And guess what happens? Guess what happens? We are, in essence, singing songs of warfare against Satan's deceptions and lies. And what did you guys use? Well, we just sang a song that proclaims the, the truth. 
One simple phrase such as, you are Jesus, my champion. You are my champion. That alone. Sometimes it takes us to study, to gather in community groups, to have discussion over it. But we resist the devil by using God's truth against his deception and lies. We submit any and all strongholds, temptations, sinful patterns, spiritual attacks. We submit them all to the lordship and truth of Jesus Christ. That tells us that Satan is defeated. How many can say amen? Satan is defeated. Satan is defeated. Satan is defeated in the ways that we have anxiety over our teenagers and children in the future. Guess what? Satan is defeated. <laughs> Satan is defeated. But he is powerfully at work. We're, we're sober-minded about that with his deception through distortion. The Bible says that he is the ruler of this world. It's John 12, John 14, John 16. The Bible says that he is the prince of the air, Ephesians 2. The Bible says that he is the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 2, chapter 4. But all throughout the New Testament, followers of Jesus are commanded to, James chapter 4, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11 says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him, because he cares about you. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him. Firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. It's, it's funny when I read this in the context you know, th that, that we can see of spiritual warfare, that when we're carrying the weights, the bitter, the bitter consequences, the emotions, the thoughts, the frustrations, the angers, all the fruit of sin that we, we carry, that we face with other people. You know, this text here in First Peter says to cast all our cares to God because he cares for us. He doesn't want us to fight those battles, you know, in our own strength. He wants us to come and he wants us to lay them uh, to the throne room of grace and find grace and mercy in our times of need. Um, that is the truth. That's the truth. We submit all things to the lordship and truth of Jesus Christ, who is our mediator, our motivation, and our model before temptation. So, to close, and then we will uh, sing and partake of the Lord's Supper. How does a follower of Jesus Christ live in the victory and freedom of Christ in the face of temptation? Well, as my mediator, I rest in the perfect obedience of Christ and victory over Satan. How many can say amen? As my motivation, I resist Satan's false accusations and lies and look to Jesus. And as my model, I renounce Satan's authority and aim to follow Jesus' lead instead. That, that I think, is a, a summary over Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13 as we, followers of Jesus, will face temptation. Amen? Let's pray. Father, now, Lord, um, as we, we don't necessarily end just yet, God, uh, because the sermon has ended, Father, we continue in a spirit of, of warfare, God. Lord, uh, we, we, as individual followers, Lord, uh, many of us, probably all of us, God, are being tempted. And we know that Satan is using any crack, any entryway that he can, Lord, to get us to believe a counterfeit, a substitute. Uh, but Lord, not, all, not just as individuals, God, uh, we, God we, we don't want to ever think, Lord, that, oh, well, things are good with me. Uh, I, I'm fine now. I'm, I'm living great. Lord, um, uh, we know that that's exactly uh, the, the, the dangerous place that any follower of Jesus can be. Got to think that things are okay. Not only that, Father, we want to confess, Lord, we don't fight 
against uh, Satan's forces alone. God, we fight it as a church. God, as a body. We fight for one another. God, so all of us here, God, let us not, Father, let us not selfishly pretend, God, in any way. Give us upon the unifying power of your spirit. Give us the discernment, God, to know that in our church right now, today, here, present with us, there are people facing huge, huge battles. And if we're here and we want to exalt Jesus, uh, we want to do so by bearing with one another, serving and loving one another in the face of temptation. Father, we release, we surrender full control to the truth and lordship of Jesus Christ. Full control. We don't want to control anything. We surrender, God. God, as we surrender control, that you would open up pathways of connection between our heart and your heart, God, and our heart and other people's hearts, our loved ones, God. Lord, um, there are parents here that need the Spirit's work, Father, to connect with their children's hearts. And up to this point, Satan has wanted to deceive all parties to control as opposed to connect. Father, would you reconcile, bring a spirit of connection, Lord. Father, we know now as, as we partake from your table, God, that the very purpose of it is communion. Lord, that we would connect with you, God. That we would commune with you, Lord, in light of the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ for our, for our place. God. I want to read 1 Corinthians 11 quickly, uh, verse 23. Please listen along with me because it will, it, it, it will pertain to the way that we, I want to invite everyone to the table. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and we had given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, we sometimes read the, the following verses. We don't always, but today we are. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some even have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So we, before I call everyone up, we've got to understand, firstly, that when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, his primary goal was to keep the cross from happening. His primary goal was to stop Jesus from being a sinless substitute to open up communion with God. The temptation is to get Jesus from living a perfect, obedient life and therefore being the sinless Lamb of God who died for the forgiveness of our sins. But we know that Jesus did defeat Satan and did willingly pay the penalty of our sins on the cross and then rose again. Nevertheless, we know Satan continues with his attacks. 
How so? He wants, Satan wants for people to partake of this communion in an unworthy manner. That's how Satan now will work. And what is an a, a unworthy manner? Is there something I need to clean? No. Unworthy is any person that will even fight a battle or, or face a temptation in their own strength, in their own self sufficiency in their own self-righteousness coming to the table in a worthy manner means I cannot do it on my own I confess I repent and I desperately receive by faith what Jesus did for me on the cross I am a sinner who acknowledges that I need a savior so this table then is for sinners. We can tell Satan, I know I am not worthy, but by faith alone, in Christ alone, by the merits of the broken body and shed blood of Christ, I am now worthy. I am clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Let's, let's stop there. The third thing then that Satan will do, okay, then, you know, this is what I'm going to do with you then. I'm going to try to keep you from confessing your sin. Don't confess your sin. Hold it in. Fight. Flee. Do whatever you need to do. Don't confess it. Don't involve people. You know, don't, don't make it known. Control it yourself. So in essence, what, Jesus, what, what Satan will do is that he'll keep you at victim right? You keep you a victim as opposed to what I would call vulnerable victor, right? Like the victory that is found in Christ through my vulnerability to know that I, without Christ, I have no hope. I'm a failure. But with the mediation, motivation, and model of Christ in my place, then I'm more than a conqueror. Then I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That if God is with me, then who or what can stand against me? We, we by way of participation of this bread and this, and this cup, we are, we are partaking of the victory of Christ applied to our lives by faith. So I would encourage all of us now, especially those of us facing battles, temptations, or even in the pit of the consequences of it, would you, by way of confession, um, that you are a sinner and you need a Savior, would you then, as you examine yourself, come up. We make our two lines. You come up, you take the bread, you take the cup, you return to your seat, and together as a church, we will proclaim the Lord's death that has defeated sin, Satan, and our death, and has promised us eternal life. Amen? So when you're ready, you can all pass and partake of the bread and wine.